Today, we're going to talk about moving from DEI awareness to DEI action in your organization. In today's job market, diversity, equity, and inclusion have become key tools for recruitment and retention. However, an organization's existing policies and procedures may be the biggest obstacles to implementing a meaningful program. To help you break down those barriers, we've called in a workplace culture consultant, author, and executive advisor in diversity strategies, Stacy Gordon, the founder of Rework Work. Stacy Gordon is a workplace culture consultant, keynote speaker, author, and executive advisor on diversity strategies. She is the founder of Rework Work and has helped companies such as American Express, ADP, Kia Motors, Hewlett Packard, GE, and the Obama Foundation, and many others to deliver education, coaching, and consulting that supports organizational change and leadership development. As a globally recognized keynote speaker, leadership consultant, and DEI strategist, Stacy has provided subject matter expertise to Harvard Business Review, SHRM, Fast Company, Skillsoft, Forbes, NPR, and BBC Radio. Stacy's book, Unbiased Addressing Unconscious Bias at Work, debuted at number one on Amazon's hot new release list, while her unconscious bias course on the LinkedIn learning platform was the number one most watched course of 2021. Stacy, welcome to Voices of HR. Thank you. Thank you. That is quite an intro, I tell you. I know sometimes I listen and I go, huh, I did do that. <laughs> <laughs> you did all of that. You did all of that. And we are so excited to talk to you today because this is a subject that needs someone like you. We need your expertise to help HR break through these barriers. I'd like to say that's the case, right? <laughs> but not everyone always wants to help. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, we're going to give it to him today. So let's start here. So it, in your experience, you are a disruptor. That's really how you're positioned in the marketplace. And you have done an incredible job of it so far with your number one book and number one on LinkedIn learning. But I found it incredibly interesting. And I wanted to start here. You have said the person most responsible for impeding progress of modernizing pay equity and gender equity or procedures that create the most inclusive workplaces is typically someone you never think would be the largest impediment and the very person that others look to for vision and direction. Who is it and why do they stand in the way? Well, unfortunately, um, sometimes that is HR. Um, and it's not their fault, right? So let me start there by saying it's not, do not set up for success. Um, mm -hmm. And so we really have to think through, it's part of the reason that my company is called Rework Work, mm -hmm. <laughs> because we have to really think about the ways that we're going to rework how we work. Um, and until we are willing to do that, we're going to continue to have these roadblocks, these impediments, we're going to continue to do the same thing over and over again, expecting different results, which we all know, right? It's the definition of insanity, mm -hmm. um, but we continue to do it over and over again. And so I think that there is a lot that HR is poised to do and has been traditionally um, the, the rug has sort of been pulled out from under them and they don't realize sometimes the actual power that they have in their fingertips. They do have power. And I'm also a true believer in identifying root causes to the impediments of growth initiatives like DE&I. Um, so HR is an impediment, not because they don't, they don't choose to be, but I suspect there's something standing behind them or in front of them that is impeding their efforts. What is the root cause to HR not being able to move DNI forward? I mean, it's really about, I would say, mindsets um, and whether or not the organization is ready for movement. Mm. So, and the person at the helm of the organization is the CEO. When the CEO is aligned, and ready and motivated, nothing stops them from getting mm -hmm. stuff done, right? 
So why is it that when it comes to DEI, we have problems all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. Well, clearly there's somebody that doesn't actually find value in it, doesn't have the um, expertise to actually move things forward, or does not have the motivation or the desire to do it. (laughs) Um, And sometimes it's a combination of all of those things. Mm -hmm. And being able to identify that um, you know, unfortunately, it, it's one of, or fortunately, it's one of the things I think that we really have to look at when deciding to work with an organization, especially if you are high up in the HR chain. If you're a CHRO, you're the chief people officer, you report to the CEO. If that CEO is not aligned with the values that you have, you shouldn't be working there mm-hmm. <laughs> because all you're going to be doing the entire time is butting up against a brick wall. And I don't know about you, but I happen to like my forehead um, and I don't like it being bloodied and bruised. And many of you go to work every day and that's what you're dealing with. I read a stat that almost 50% of heads of diversity turned over in 2022. So last year, over 50% turned over. And I wonder if it doesn't harken back to what you just said. There's frustration because there was at least initial commitment, because they hired these individuals, but yet these individuals aren't getting the support at the top. But what I find interesting is when I read your bio, companies like American Express, ADP, Hewlett Packard, GE, the Obama Foundation, they they were all supportive enough to bring you in. So what is it that compels or compelled these organizations to bring someone like a disruptor like you in their organization to train their leaders. What was it? Was there one thing, two things? What was it? So, and and not saying this is about any of the companies that have brought me in, but just mm-hmm. generically for a moment, <laughs> um, because one of the things you said was that they, there was commitment, right, to bring me mm-hmm. in. That doesn't necessarily mean that there was commitment to do the work. Okay. So we talk a lot about check the box activities, right? Mm -hmm. And if you think about the fact that it completely tracks, because if in 2022, 50% of people turned over, makes makes absolute sense, because in 2020 was when everyone said, oh my goodness, the world's on fire, and we need to hire a DEI person, not knowing why, what they were going to do, not providing them with any type of resources Mm -hmm. or any real plan or a goal. We just put out a, a salary and said, hire a DEI person. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is no surprise that those people have left because the statistics also show that most, uh, DEI practitioners do not stay in their role for more than 18 months. Mm. So that would be right on (laughs) if you do the math, right? Um, and why don't they stay in those roles? Mm -hmm. Uh, I actually mentioned it in my book as well, right? It's like this idea that we are bringing individuals in. We want them to run a department, and I'm using air quotes when I say department, because usually they're a department of one or th- you know, three right. people, if you're lucky. Uh, that's right. not actually a department. Um, it's barely a team. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and so you're expecting these individuals to come in and perform miracles, because clearly you couldn't do it before they got there. And somehow you expect that this person is going to come in and change the entire organization with no influence, no power, no resources, no money, no backing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I I don't know where and how within an organization that has ever worked for any initiative we've ever had ever in the history of the organization. Mm -hmm. But yet with DEI, we somehow think that there's going to be this magic sauce where that's going to happen. Yeah, I think that's interesting because if if I look back on, and, and I'm just one data point, but I think this, I think many other C-suites executives would tell you the same thing, that I was able to create outperformance. I was able to help grow the organization 80% and lead people and do all those things because I always had the CEO's backing every single time. I had whatever resources I needed. I had support. And so what would happen if I didn't? Well, there's no way that you can create outperformance. You can even actually execute something without support from the top. And it's interesting because I think what I also found in my research and my book is that a lot of organizations have great intent. Sometimes they do hire diverse candidates, but once they come into the organization, the organization was unprepared 
for the disruption that was going to happen. I think they just expected to hire diverse candidates. They heard all of the great financial results that can come about because of diverse organizations. You know, diverse teams are 40% produce 40% higher revenue than those that are all male or all female. I mean, we all know the statistics, but they weren't prepared to do the work to prepare their organization to become a diverse organization. So if we go back and kind of pull that thread, what is it that organizations should do, should start thinking about as they think about implementing and executing a DEI successful initiative? they really have to start to think about, is this something they want to do? Because there is a pervasive view, right? Like that everyone should do it. Mm. And by it, right, we first have to just d- define what is it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, because that's also a problem. Many of us don't know what it is. I feel like Bill right. Clinton right now. But <laughs> <laughs> But it's really important because if you are the CHRO and I am the CDO and we have our CEO in the room and we all go off right, with a, a, an idea of what it is and it's very different, you're thinking gender diversity, I'm thinking overall diversity, they're thinking we want racial diversity, and then we go off and we tell our recruitment team what we're looking for and they come back with something completely different, two of us are going to be upset. <laughs> because Mm -hmm. we did not adequately align on what exactly it is that we're trying to uh, achieve. So that's the very first thing is, what are you trying to achieve? But even before that, it's why. Mm -hmm. Most organizations do not have their why. The why is so important. Uh, You know, it's Simon Sinek, right, that says, start with why. Mm -hmm. For the love of God, start with why. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a good why, every time that the resources dry up. You go, what was this initiative? Why are we doing this? I don't know. Gone, right? Mm-hmm. The CEO was the one that was pushing it, but he's left. Nobody else cares. Gone. Right? The, the chief diversity mm-hmm. officer quits. And then you go, well, the chief diversity officer was making 180K. We could just hire a manager in their role instead and bring mm-hmm. the salary down, right? Now yeah. you've got no influence. But there's just all of these things that happen when you don't have a proper why. And so we want to go to action. We want to um, to do all the things, right? We want to, uh, gosh, and I, I won't even call this an action, but June is, is the biggest one that I think about when it's a, uh, you know, Gay Pride Month, mm-hmm. Pride Month, and everyone says we are going to change our logo to a rainbow. It looks really pretty. Mm-hmm. I tell you, it does, but. If you're the same organization who has told me that, well, you don't have any, you know, gay individuals in your workplace, and I'm looking at you like you've got three heads, why have you changed your logo to a a rainbow? Mm -hmm. Not only have you changed your logo, but you've spent time, energy, money with your marketing department deciding how long you're going to change it and which, how it's going to look and all of these different things. All of that money can be much better spent making sure that you actually have pay equity in your workplace. Mm -hmm. I think we'd prefer that over a logo change. Well, and consumers are wise to that, right? They're wise to the fact that if you say one thing and you do something else, they do eventually become wise to it. I think eventually, right? Mm -hmm. But it's, it's taking some time. Um, it's like all the individuals that changed, you know, to a black square in, in 2020, right? Mm-hmm. Well, black lives matter. Mm-hmm. Sure they do, you know, but yet mm-hmm. we still have an individual fighting for their lives, uh, in, in a hospital because they were shot in the head by mm-hmm. somebody, right? And I'm sure an individual like that, you say, well, that's in the community. But what we have to remember is that community member works in your company. They come to work. They are your managers. They are your heads of departments. They are your CFOs. They are your accountants. They are your HR people. So we like to compartmentalize and say, oh, this thing is happening over here and that doesn't matter. But we have to realize those are the very people that we are interacting with day after day after day in our workplaces. Mm -hmm. And it's why our workplace policies aren't changing. (laughs) Right. So let, let's go to that. Let's go to the solution because I think, you know, HR is frustrated as well, right? Because they may see marketing put the pride flag out in June 
on all their marketing materials, but HR is sitting there saying, but we don't have the momentum. We don't have the right really to even promote this because we aren't doing this internally. And anyone who knows anything about brand equity, they know that you cannot ever say one thing and do something else. It will eventually degrade your, your equity. So in addition to having HR, I suspect start with why. And number two, define what it is that you're trying to execute when it comes to DEI. What other tips and tools can you give to our HR pros that are listening to start initiating positive change within their organization? Is it stats? Is it initiatives internally? Is it a groundswell support? Where have you seen the most success? It, it definitely is some stats. Um where I find where we've gone into an organization and everyone's sick of surveys, I get it. Yeah. Um, but they're, again, they're sick of surveys because ask yourself, what have you done with the data? Mm -hmm. Right. The last time that you, you did a survey, what did you do with that information? Who did you tell about it? Um, uh, what was the transparency and communication and what action came from it? And usually the, the results of that is not very good. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So you now have to go back and you've got to do internal marketing and you have to say, oh, no, really, we mean it this time. We're going to do something with it. Mm. So that's the first thing you actually have to do before you can even get the survey data, because then you otherwise you're going to get really poor survey results. Right. Mm -hmm. um, poor uh, participation. And so when you're working with an organization and you're only getting 30 percent responding, not helpful. Mm -hmm. You want higher numbers. So even before you can put the survey out to get the data, you've got to go back and do some marketing. And you can only do that marketing, again, when you have your why, because you're going to say, well, we need you to do this because. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you can't say that, why bother do the survey? And then you also need to be able to say, once you do this, we're going to come back to you and let you know the results of it. And then we're going to actually do something based upon the results of it. And we're going to let you know what we've done based upon the results. Because sometimes companies will do something. People don't know about it. They have no clue. They're like, our company did that? Really? I had no idea. <laughs> so all of those things have to happen. Um, and the data is really important because once you get it, you also have to be able to cut it de demographically to be able to show. Um, and I think that's one of the, the most striking uh, results that I've seen with an organization where we asked the question, and I'm trying to remember exactly which question it was. It was, um, oh, I think it was around, it was around women and um, do women, it was around it, like, do, do women uh, get support within the organization? And so I believe the number was like, 70% of people said yes, if you look at the employees as a whole. And then when we looked, we cut the data, women and men, and realized that men overwhelmingly, it was like 80 something percent said yes, women get support in the workplace. Mm. Women, it was like 30%. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so now that's a number that you were like, oh, holy, you know right. what? <laughs> yeah. That's a really big difference. What is it that the women or say, right? So if you just mm -hmm. looked at the main first result, you'd say, okay, you know, 70 something percent, we're doing okay. We're not failing. It's all right. Mm -hmm. And we don't have to worry about it. But when you cut it in that way, and then don't even look at, you know, the, the demographics when it comes to race, right? Mm -hmm. Completely different conversation. So mm -hmm. those are the things you have to be able to dig deep. And you've got to be willing to see that data. Because I also had a conversation with a HR person who said, she said, Stacy, <laughs> we did a survey. She said the data, it was sad. She's like, I almost didn't want to read the comments. She goes, it hurt my heart to mm -hmm. read some of the things that were said in there. And I said, but you actually are going to sit down and read them all, right? And she's mm -hmm. like, yeah, eventually. And I said, so what are you doing with that? She said, well, we're going to have a town hall. So I'm like, yes, you're going to communicate this out. And she said, well, we're just going to talk about, because one of the questions they asked was, what should we start doing? What should we stop doing? Mm -hmm. And what should we... Um, I think continue. Yes, continue. Um, and so one of the things was a lot of people were saying, well, we want you to stop with DEI because they don't understand why we're doing it, right? You haven't given the why, all of that's missing. And she said, well, we're just going to talk about what we're going to continue doing in our town hall. And I was like, no, mm -hmm. no, you can't do that. 
I was, she said, yeah, our CEO, we've already given him talking points. I was like, hey. <laughs> wow, wow. <laughs> like that's not the way to go, but that's what we do in our organizations. We find the silver lining and say, let's just focus there and we'll just keep pushing through. But you have to address the negative. You have to have the communication. You have to be transparent and say, look, a lot of you said this. We need to have a conversation about why. Why is it that maybe HR to some extent or even C-suite doesn't want to hear the results? Right? They I mean, are scared. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. They are very fearful. I mean, and, and there are some C-suite executives who will completely embrace what the people are telling them. And uh, I know CEOs, Don Zier was on here a couple weeks ago, uh, CEO of Nutrisystem, and she would be one of those individuals, one of those C-suite, top of the line CEOs who would say, give it to me straight, give me the data, let's see what we're dealing with so that we can make it better. But then you still have a whole bunch of executives saying, well, do, do I really want to hear what people are saying? Do I really want the results? Because that's going to make me have to act. And I don't know exactly what to do. So let's give them the benefit of the doubt. And let's say the results do come back and women don't feel that they're being heard people of color don't feel supported in the organization. There's conflict all over the place. My research showed that 100% of high performers, 80% of women and people of color are being targeted, bullied, and abused in the workplace. Lowers engagement, lowers productivity. So that is happening in our organizations. We just don't know to what extent until you ask the question. Right. So you get the data back and what is, if, if you have a C-suite that's reluctant, is there any data that HR can share with them? Maybe as comparison data that says, this is why we need to move forward. As ugly as this looks right now, we can't ignore it. Is there anything that you can give to HR, put in their hands that would help them? Yeah. I mean, I think that they have to be able to have that candid conversation with the CEO, right? And so there's also that it's like, do you have the relationship? Do you have mm. the influence? Are you seen as an advisor to where you can sit down and have that candid conversation? Mm. Because if not, right, you're going to have a real hard time, even with the data, uh, because a lot of it comes down to our own level of influence and power. Mm. Um, and if we're not willing and able, I won't say willing, but if we're not able to really sit down with this individual and have this conversation and say, Mr. And Mrs. CEO, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what I believe we need to do. And this is the course of action that I think we should take. I think the other thing you can then say is, okay, if we don't take this course of action, this is what I believe is going to happen. And this is what I believe the consequences are going to be. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, it's up to you as a CEO, mm -hmm. you get to pick, but I'm providing you with consequences of both mm -hmm. and actions for both. Um, and should they decide to go down the road that you disagree with, at least you have put it out there, right? You've provided the statistics, you provided the information. And then when that happens, I hate to be the person that says, I told you so, but you really have to be that person and say, I warned you of this. I provided you with the documentation and we still went down that pathway. So now I'm advising this. Are you willing to listen? And you've got to be able to back that up. You also have to be willing to, you know, there's a lot of movement happening. Um, I'm in so many different HR groups and all I do is lurk. I just listen and I read all the things that are happening and I go, oh, thank God I don't work in HR. I just, <laughs> I don't know how you do They've got it. a tough job. <laughs> They've got a tough job. But a lot of it is that uh, relationship that you have to be able to build with the individuals that you were attempting to influence. And so even before you can do the survey, right, mm -hmm. you've got to create that relationship um, and, and have them want to hear the information um, and, and what it's going to do for the organization. Because again, we've all heard the generic statistics, 40%, you know, increase in productivity. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds 
It's interesting, mm -hmm. but right. really for our organization, in what way? Well, how is that going to translate? We really have to be able to translate that down to your specific business and what that's going to look like. And, um, you know, I just came back from, from Ireland. And mm -hmm. so, you know, what used to be a much more homogenous society is getting much more diverse pretty quickly because of mm -hmm. all the tech companies that are over there. And um, sitting with a couple of um, managers while I was there last week, you know, one of them asked me and said, well, one of the issues we're having is how do you get individuals to see, you know, managers, leaders to see um, their own bias when they're, when they're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And that's some of the things we're struggling with, right? Yeah, we are. So if you have, so I suspect there are HR leaders out there and they are courageous and they do have enough confidence to be, as Dr. Renee Booth refers to it, the CEO whisperer. Um, has a good relationship and can go into the C-suite and say, listen, what we're doing isn't working. Here's what we're going to try. It would help if they didn't have to go it alone. I know that there's strengths in numbers because I've done it. I went around and I've gotten my peers support before I would go to the big table and say, this is, this is what I'm trying to implement and here's why and, and give all my stats and data behind it. Is there, do you recommend that HR gets groundswell of support before they walk in, even if they're courageous and they're willing to tackle DEI within their organization? Absolutely. Um, you know, how they do that, I think, is going to depend upon each organization. Um, when we come into an organization, we don't always just do surveys, right? We'll do mm -hmm. the, the, the listening circles, you know, all of those are data points. Mm -hmm. um, even in the workshops that we do, just the feedback that we get at the end of that, we ask, you know, like, what is going on? How can we help? I think about, um, I think it was a CEO that was doing this um, at Heinz uh, many years ago when I met with them. And what they would do is they would sit they had a, a lunch area and they knew, uh, everyone in the company knew that this CEO would be in the lunchroom from this time to this time and you could come and ask questions. Mm -hmm. And she would just sit and listen. And she didn't really talk, she just listened. She said it was absolutely mm -hmm. the best way to get information because people would tell her all kinds of things. Oh, and then sure. she would use that to then figure out like what are some of the hot spots? What are some of the things that are, are coming up? And so HR is fond of saying we have a, an open door policy. Mm -hmm. You have to ask yourself, do you really have mm -hmm. an open door policy? Can mm -hmm. people come in and tell you what is happening? Are you ga gathering that data in a way that is going to allow you to be able to then, you know, um, coalesce that and put it together and show what is actually happening on the ground within the organization? And so there's a lot of different ways you can do it. But I think that's where you, that's the, the beauty of being able to be creative mm -hmm. and figuring out what works for your organization. Some people might not come into your office. Some people might actually want old school, you know, drop a, a little note card into a box, right? Anonymous note card outside your door. It might be that once a month you host listening circles. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but start to get a little cre creative and figure out how can I get the information that I need to make the changes that I know that you want. So do you have, I mean, you've worked with some incredible organizations, um, both, I believe, in the U.S. and abroad. Is there one that comes to mind that you were called into that maybe had either tried DNI before you arrived or they were just thinking about it, but once you came in, all of a sudden there was a tipping point and it accelerated and they were able to, to some extent, successfully, and I, and I say that, you know, with you know, with a little bit of trepidation, because is it, it's never really finished. And I don't think right. you can ever say it's successful. Um, but is there a company that comes to mind? And can you share a little bit about them and what they did? Yeah, you know, I think about the ones, it's usually the smaller organizations. Mm. Um, because I think those are the ones I have a little bit more affinity for, I'm probably mm -hmm. biased, right? They're really trying. Um, and I think about this one organization where they had really just this one DNI person. It wasn't even really her role, but it became her role. 
um, as the director, and they were a smallish nonprofit. And her role really was to kind of change all the folks. And she sat with us and she said, she goes, I don't know if this is even going to work. She said, right. because we, we brought in someone a year ago, nobody really liked what they had to say. And, and unfortunately, what I found, especially in 2020, right, we were get, having a lot of people throwing on the, 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 the DEI hat mm-hmm. and going out and saying things to people that maybe they were not ready for. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think about, um, you know, everyone, I, I joke and I say everyone was reading how to be a, an, an anti-racist and white um, privilege. Fragility, yes, right? yes. Um, and those two books, it was they were flying off the shelves, right? And my question was always like, eh, are you ready for that? I think that's like deep end. Like, do you even know how to swim? <laughs> you know? It's true. And so for many organizations, this was happening. You were bringing these people in and they were coming in, shaking their finger and saying all kinds of things. And everyone was like, ah. Mm-hmm. So it was a lot of mess that happened in 2020. Mm-hmm. And so in 2021, 2022, we were getting called in and people were um, feeling trepidation about having us come in because they would say, well, Stacey, we've had someone come in and it wasn't well received mm-hmm. and everyone's upset. So now we're having to come in and fix right what has happened and then sell ourselves again about why this makes sense. Right. So this had happened for this nonprofit organization and uh, we just really worked with them and we had some really great sessions and she found herself being given right more resources, a little bit more influence because people mm-hmm. started to see that oh this this does matter. We're not coming in and blaming and shaming and shaking our fingers at folks. Right. We are having the conversation about what it is that you can do, because like, as you said earlier, people really want to do something mm-hmm. better, right? They want to make their mm-hmm. workplaces inclusive. Nobody wants to come to work and be in a place where people are this conflict um, right. and, and divisiveness. Right. Um, so people do want that. And I think that working with that organization, we were able to see how over time, um, I think we're like two years in now, they are still working on it they're now coaching all of their directors um Mm -hmm. and you know they're slowly bit by bit working towards um you know education i would say really Mm -hmm. is is that place where we we need more education about the ways in which um bias pops up Mm -hmm. um and in fact i was talking to someone about this just yesterday and they said you know when i learned about unconscious bias, it really opened my eyes. And now I see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like I see it in everything. And it's actually kind of, it's like, it's, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. Mm-hmm. And it's like, yeah, it is. It really is. Um, but what uh, helps is learning how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. It's learning how to flex and how to manage around it. And also understanding that we're going to stick our foot in our mouths and say something to somebody and it's not going to be great. But what we're learning is how to manage the mess, right? The mm-hmm. messiness of this work. I think you make such an interesting point because I I don't think I have ever seen pointing the finger and making someone not feel worthy, heard, successful as a way to motivate them right. to do something else, especially when they don't completely understand it. And I think that's an excellent point that it's the approach. The approach matters. And so when HR thinks about how they're going to craft their message and get the right data and be credible at the table to initiate this type of change within their organization, it has to come from a positive but real standpoint is what I hear you saying. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, and, you know, crafting the message um, is important because I always think back to the old school adage that our, our, probably our, all of our mothers said, right? It's not what you say, it's how you say it. It is. <laughs> um, sometimes that really matters. Um, it is being credible. So having the data and the backup um, mm-hmm. to be able to say, no, it's not just me. It's not just my gut feel. It's not just what I'm looking for. It is actually across the board. Mm-hmm. There is a consensus um, and then it's being creative and understanding that I think in this work, you cannot be rigid. You can't say, right. this is how we're doing it. And we're doing it this way every single time. Right. Because that's not going to work. You've got to be able to be creative and understand that in order for me to get 
information and and it's a two-way street also not just get information give information I've got to be flexible in how people are going to hear it. Mm -hmm. um, I might be working with people who are neurodivergent. I might be working with people who really don't understand where I'm coming from um, in, in this point of view. And well, I might be mistaking anger for frustration mm -hmm. or mistaking frustration for not caring. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and we really, we do that sometimes. Yeah. And I always, you know, like fast forward to an organization that's successful with this. And I would suspect, um, I've observed this in my line of work as well, that they are typically very purpose-driven organizations that are very respectful to each other, that all want the same thing, that want to serve clients in the best way. They want to lead their industries. There is this inspiration within their culture that makes them want to succeed. And they want to become educated and enlightened on how to do that. Would you say that's true or false? I'd say true to an extent. Um, there are certain words that I am trying to take out of my vocabulary. Mm. Um, one of those is respect, uh, because how I envision being respected and how you envision being respected can be very two different things. Mm. And I like to use the example of uh, ma'am and sir, right? Mm. So, in the United States, if you're in the South, you're going to have people who will ma'am and sir you to death. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, and I just, I got in the elevator the other day and somebody said, oh, sorry, ma'am. And I was about to be like, did you just ma'am me? <laughs> but I stopped myself because I said, you know what? They're showing a sign of respect. They are, yes. <laughs> but in my head, I was like, ugh, I don't like that, right? Uh, right? I mean, so understanding that how I envision that you should respect me and how you envision you should respect mm -hmm. me is going to depend upon context and how you were raised and many other cultural differences. And a lot of times we have conflict because of that. You mm -hmm. know, this person wasn't respectful to me. Really? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Because we haven't really delved into how people show up differently. Um, the other word that I'm trying to take out of my uh, language is professionalism. Mm. Same thing, right? What you deem as professional and what I deem as professional can be very different. Um, and these are standards, you know, and then we start to get down the, down the rabbit hole, but these are standards mm. that are baked into white supremacy culture <laughs> mm. and capitalism um, and, if, and the patriarchy. <laughs> mm. And if we have not spent time unpacking and educating ourselves on those concepts, <laughs> Uh, which right. I know many of us right now, we're fighting against uh, understanding these things. Yeah. Um, that is really important to understand why also we start to have conflict in the workplace once we start to have more diversity in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think it's, it's, I think it's interesting what you just said, because when I use the words respect, it's, I would hope that there would be a definition that we could all agree to. But what you're saying is, it really depends on the history of the individual, what their experiences are, maybe where they're raised, maybe geographic location. And so how do organizations then come together when there's so many different perspectives? I think that right there just probably stalls a lot of de and I efforts because it's kind of like, where is the win in all of this? Like, how can I make this happen? Yeah. Um, you know, and so, and not that I'm picking on it, but I'm like, Oh, you used the word. This is great. Um, so you just <laughs> asked like, where's the win? And yeah. I think about that's another one of those things, right? We get into this competitive nature. We want to mm -hmm. win. We want to be right. We have a war on talent, right? Like yeah. all of these things are so um, filled with, just so like we're, we're so used to using this type of language and that is where our brain goes. But the, this is a mindset shift and understanding that it's not about winning. It's not about creating a right for everyone. It's about understanding that in this context, in our conversation, mm -hmm. this works. But what we're doing right now might not work for somebody else. And that is very difficult for people to get because like I said, they, they have to be able to flex. Most managers have not been taught proper conflict management. They haven't been mm -hmm. taught empathy. They haven't been taught any of the basics that are going to help you flex 
in the moment. Mm -hmm. And so what most managers want to do is say, these are my rules. This is how it works. We're doing it this way for everyone because this is, um, this is equal and this is fair. Mm -hmm. And they don't understand what equity is. Equitable (laughs) is not the same as equal, right? Mm -hmm. Equity is the pathway to equal. Um, and you can't get to equal without equity, but most people don't understand equity. And Mm -hmm. so for this, you know, uh, broader conversation, we want to say, well, our organization of, you know, 10,000, 50,000 people, we have to have rules. Well, of course you do, right? You've got to have guidelines. We're going to have guiding, right? Guideposts, but it doesn't mean that. Uh, it has to be done a certain way, absolutely this way every single time. And an example of that would be, um, even if we go back to uh, HR and our um, uh, policy, our handbooks, right? Mm-hmm. We have a handbook that explains how we're supposed to do something. Most old school handbooks will say, if you have an issue with your manager, you need to go like right, one step above that to your manager's mm-hmm. manager, right? And that's about it. Right. And that's all you can do. Or you can go to HR. It Mm -hmm. it spells out very clearly what you can do. What you cannot do is, you know, skip level and go too far, right? Because then that's Mm -hmm. frowned upon and there's rules in place and blah, 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 blah. Just like, why not, right? Mm -hmm. If I can talk to this person, why um, why are we preventing people from having, from communicating throughout the organization? Why are those rules in place? So it's just understanding that sometimes the rules that we have we keep them there because we've always had them mm-hmm. and we keep them there because we go, that makes sense. But we have to start understanding that some of the rules we have, we don't actually need them <laughs> we, and we don't have to uh, interpret them the way we have always interpreted them. But again, if we go back to that respect, right? It's like, yeah. well, it's a respect thing. You don't do this because it's respectful to me as your manager. Well, maybe not. Or professional. Right. right. Or yeah. Exactly. But maybe I'm not trying to disrespect you or be unprofessional. I just have a better relationship with this person and I can under, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are there, so for HR, are there top two rules that you have seen most organizations have in place that need to be disrupted, that need to be thought of differently in order for D, E, and I to flourish within their organization? Oh, absolutely. Um, internal um, transfers, right? Just being able to change jobs, hop into a different team. I think that's one of them. Um, and the other is advancements. And like, how do people get ad- advancements, promotions? A lot of the process, you know, I'm using air quotes again when I say processes, because many people have a process, but mm-hmm. they don't follow it. Most people yeah. don't know what it is. Um, and, or if they do follow it, they only follow it for a certain set to, set of people. Um you know, performance improvement plans are another one that, <laughs> mm-hmm. again, we find that performance improvement plans are given to one set of our organization, but not so much to another. More people will get a second or a third chance before they get put on a performance improvement plan, but not so much for our women or our professionals of color. You know, they're the first ones to performance improvement plan and we're going to pip you out of here. 90 days, you're gone. Right. 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 <laughs> so. That's like we'll start there. <laughs> that, that, that's great. I mean, because I think that's where our HR pros are going to say, okay, sometimes I don't know what I don't know. Right. And so you just pointed out a couple of different things that they can at least start watching and learning. And when they get their data, really look at that or ask that question, because then they can start making improvements there. Well, and not just making the improvements, but before you can even, so I always say, a process can't change until your mindset does. Mm. So you can change the process if you want to, but if you don't understand why you're changing the process, I you know I keep coming back to the why, but if the you why. don't understand yeah. the, the why behind it, you can change the process all you want. I am fond of saying that, you know, I can send you, I can send your recruiters to the moon and ask them to recruit Martians and they will still come back with, you know, moon folk, because they're biased, right? Like yeah. you were taking the same mindsets to the to a different process. Mm-hmm. So without the mindset shift, without the understanding of why these things are important, it doesn't matter 
what process changes you make. And this is why we're having the same problems over and over again, because we just keep changing the title of the thing, right? We change the label, we give it a new shiny name, but it's the same process pretty much over mm -hmm. and over again. So the mindset has to, the, the shift has to happen there. So if there's one thing that you could leave with us today, it's in anything that you do, make sure that you have your why and make sure that you create a mindset shift along with it. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So at the end of every podcast, we play something called rapid fire questions. Are you willing to play? I am willing to play. All right, let's do this. What is the book or books, and you can't say your own, that you've given most often as a gift and why? Um, so Stand Out, which is actually on my shelf up here uh, by Marcus Buckingham. And um, I have given that probably, it's an oldie but goodie, um, but I've given that because I really 100% <laughs> believe in what he states in there, which is that we all have strengths. We're all really good at something and we waste so much time trying to get better at things we're not good at when we could just give it to somebody else who is really good at it. And so I'm all about efficiencies and creating teams and collaborating. And so I love the book for that reason. Who is getting DE&I right today? Uh, well, it depends on what month you ask and the context, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, if you'd asked me a couple of years ago, I would say Target because I think they were one of the first to take uh, boy and girl aisles out of their stores, right? And just have toys, mm -hmm. which makes total sense. Mm -hmm. uh, we no longer had the pink and the blue aisles and all of that. Um, I mean, they've done a really good job recently, um, but they're um, uh, per one of the people who was a strong proponent, um, Caroline uh, Wanga, I think is her last name, just left. Um, and so we'll be interested to see what happens with Target because it's exactly what we're talking about, right? You've got the mm -hmm. person who's a big proponent of something who was there and pushing and now she's gone. So what will Target do? <laughs> um, I think Lego was another one that has done pretty well. Uh, but I, same thing, I always say, well, they're still working hard. They seems to still have quite a lot of boy, girl Legos. Mm -hmm. um, and... Um, they're doing, I think, well internally with staff, but, you know, sort of externally as they're, they're doing their work with the community and with, with children. Uh, children are our future, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> I think how we indoctrinate them into DEI is important. What move did you make that had the biggest positive impact on your career? Um, so I would say before, so I was working as a recruiter and um a third party agency recruiter. And I really was at that point in my career where I realized that companies were, you know, doing DEI wrong. Um, and I was very frustrated with the way they were hiring. And I thought, how can I find out internally what they're doing? So I actually took a job um, with a, a bank so that I could learn. Uh, and I went in as a, I can't remember my exact title, but it was like a hybrid DEI recruitment type role. Mm. Um, and so that was really helpful to me to just see the way that companies internally were working. Because before that, I had this idea that they had it, they must have a proper system in place and that things were working. Mm -hmm. And just watching how that worked, I thought, wow, if this is what's happening, no wonder we're all screwed. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Your eyes were opened. What advice would you give to a smart, driven college student about to enter the world? And what advice should they ignore? Um, I would say try different things. Like it's okay to try on different jobs, mm -hmm. um, especially as you're young, you know? Yeah. I, I, people are gonna be upset with me for saying this, but you don't like a job, quit get another one. You know, it, it, life is too short and you're too young and full of vigor to stay in a crappy job where your manager doesn't respect you. And I think the, uh, the young folk have already gotten this part down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They've kind of figured they that out. I don't think they need me to tell them, but I just want to say good on you right on. <laughs> <laughs> Make them work for it. <laughs> so try. What advice would you give to someone just starting out in HR? Um, similar, right? Try the different roles. Try on all the different hats in HR. 
learn the different things, um, just discover what you like and what you don't like about HR, um, look at the, the different opportunities, understand that, you know, HR business partner in one organization is going to be a little bit different in another organization. Mm-hmm. And, you know, HR director is going to be some sort of inflated title at a smaller company versus, you know, in a larger company. Mm-hmm. And what does that look like? And so just understanding those nuances and um, knowing your value and what your worth is um, as you're learning along the way. Where can people go to learn more about you? So my website is reworkwork.com, but I usually send people to either my LinkedIn, um, which is if you just Google Stacey Gordon, I usually pop right up, um, and to our sort of sub website, which is learn.reworkwork.com, because in there we are creating a sandbox for you to come and play with us, um, where we're just putting lots of content, because what we need is in light of this cancel culture, um, place safe spaces where people can come and try things out. And so that's what we are trying to create and cultivate. Love it. Today, we have been joined by Stacy Gordon, founder of Rework Work. Thanks again, Stacy, for joining me. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. I really hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much for watching. We would love it if you shared your thoughts on any of the topics we discussed in the comments below. And if you got value from the video, it would mean the world to us if you hit the like button and subscribe to the HR Morning channel. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Voices of HR.